Hello and uh, welcome to my introductory lecture on leadership. My name is Jem Bendel and I'm a professor of sustainability leadership at the University of Cumbria in the UK. Now this lecture is going to provide an introduction to leadership from a critical perspective. Before we can begin to learn how to be better leaders or less bad leaders or help other people with that, it's important to explore what we mean by leadership and what we might be assuming. Despite most of us knowing that enterprise, organizations, movements, politics are all about ideas and collective action, there's a widespread view which places great emphasis on special individuals. Shaped over decades, perhaps longer, it's the view that leadership by any senior role holder is one of the most important or the most critical issue in either organisational or social change. The stories we, we read about, about the past, are often stories of individuals rather than wider social processes and groups. Hence the word history, his story, not their story. This view is promoted today in our media when they assume the key salience of whoever has a senior role in an organisation. It means that when things go horribly wrong, we look at senior role holders. Many leadership courses I've been on reflect uh, that assumption that the person at the top is the most important thing for organisations or communities of all kinds. But in this leadership course, we take a somewhat different approach. I think this different approach is important as our normal lives and assumed futures seem to be falling apart around us. We're going to need leaderful groups to emerge to help reduce harm and save what we can in kind and joyful ways. So I'm recording this lecture at home during lockdown, so uh, please forgive any uh, background noise or things that happen in, in houses. Um, we're going to, uh, in this lecture, explore popular concepts of leadership to identify some unhelpful myths about leaders and leadership. This will be a way of considering critical approaches where critical doesn't just mean being questioning or negative, but involves looking at the power relations involved in the choice and use of concepts in order to help us to be more consciously engaged with life. I will give one example or case study from my own work in strategic communications and leadership. Because before I went full-time on deep adaptation to climate change, when I was a consultant, um, I acted as a communications strategist and speechwriter to the Labour Party in the UK for the 2017 general election. I worked with the Leader's Office and Shadow Chancellor's Office on the manifesto and speeches. Now, questions of leadership were central to that campaign, so now that Jeremy Corbyn's no longer party leader, I think it's okay now to share some of the thinking behind the work I did with him and his team. Um, and even if you aren't interested in politics or the UK, or UK politics, hopefully it will illustrate the power of uh, discourse, of framing of narratives in the realm of, of leadership. Now the aim of this lecture is to prepare the ground for us exploring new meanings and practices of more sustainable leadership at a time when organisations and societies face crisis and even collapse. So in our live classes, we're going to go much deeper, but I hope um, this lecture will help get things started. Now, um, you've probably, if you've ever been to a, a train station or an airport, gone and had a look at the, uh, the business section, um, and you'll see all these different books on uh, leadership and uh, you'll have seen many of these different uh, phrases. It's, it's as if any, uh, you think of any word and you can put it ahead of leadership. Authentic, charismatic, visionary, effective, collected, distributed, responsible, global, servant, spiritual, etc. Um, it's a, a very popular topic to write about, how to be a better leader. Um, and it can be seem quite um, like it, it's a, it's it's an area for management fads, really. Um, and I think what happens in that is that we then deproblematize the second word. We 
assume what we mean by leadership. Uh, and so rather than just saying let's talk sustainable leadership or sustainability leadership and then just talk about what sustainable or sustainability means, um, I think it's really important to look at what we mean by leadership. Um, and I, I organised a, um, a conference about five years ago, the first conference I organised on leadership at my university uh, in the Lake District. And we had a few um, headline speakers. Um, one of them uh, was Nandita Das, who's a director and actress uh, from India. And she, um, I asked her, like I asked everyone, uh, to give me a quote about how, what leadership meant to them ahead of uh, coming to the conference. And so this is what she said. Leadership is not about having followers, but following your passion and believing that a better world is possible. Um, now, I thought that was inspiring. I still do. Uh, and it really, I think, also captures something about her approach uh, to her work. And then I shared it with another person who I was very delighted was coming, uh, um, uh, an environment minister at the time. Uh, and I shared the quote uh, and said, could you maybe offer one of your own? And she said, that's ridiculous. How can you be a leader without followers? Other things are important, but then use a different word not leadership. And so just there in the organising of the conference, we saw how people meant such different things uh, when they were talking about the same thing, or at least they thought they were, we thought we were talking about the same thing. So I think it's really um, helpful, and it also can be a bit of fun, to just clarify what do we mean by leadership. Um, and I don't mean leader, I mean leadership, the act of leading. And so before we go on, please just take a moment. So you could just press pause on this video and write your own definition down. Or if you've done this before in some preparatory work for my course, then look back at what you wrote before continuing. Yeah, define leadership. Leadership is dot, dot, dot. Okay, have you done that? Welcome back. I have a working definition and I'll always call it a working definition because it's kind of provisional and fallible. Um, for me leadership is usefully thought of in this way. Uh, leadership involves helping groups to understand why and how to work together for significant change. Now in that phrase you can see then we've got ideas about uh, collectives collaborating, we've got ideas about significance of change and change rather than just stasis. Um, it's a bit imprecise because it says that leadership involves, so it doesn't restrict it to this, but that it should really involve this. It's an emphasis, emphasis on helping, not directing. Um, and it's quite focused on the, the motivation, the why, um, and the how, but not really so much on, on the what, the what gets done. And that's for me quite, quite deliberate. So you've had a definition of leadership, you've offered one, you've written one down. Um, I don't know if that was there some similarity there or not, you might want to, to think about it. But also now, was there an assumption uh, about your definition that it meant you thought it was good leadership? So if you look back at my definition, um, you know, a significant change uh, could be a really bad one. Uh, however, if you really help people understand why and how to work together, then that's unlikely to be a really bad one. So there's an implication in my definition here that this would be good leadership. Uh, but yeah, have a look back and see whether you've really uh, been clear about what is good somehow, some kind of values you have there. Um, but otherwise, actually, stop the video and... Uh, and also see if you could write down, clarify what you mean by good leadership, and then continue. So I ask my uh, participants in my courses to do this before we gather. And I've done that for the, the people who are gathering at my next leadership course. Uh, and uh, they offered their ideas of the leaders and the leadership that they Cited as uh, they cite as inspiring, and I picked a few of them here, um, just a few. 
So Christina, Christiana uh, Figueres, a Costa Rican diplomat and uh, uh, former um, chair of a, well, the main climate intergovernmental process. And um, she was identified by one of the participants in my course as uh, an inspiring leader because truthful, direct, yet utterly compelling and caring. Another participant identified the uh, U.S. Congress woman, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who was elected as the uh, youngest uh, woman ever in Congress. And uh, the key qualities there were identified as for showing you can be young, female, true to your values, represent real people and fearless, fearlessly take on powerful billionaires. Now another participant focused more on leadership rather than an individual and also um, leadership as a sort of a, a quality or a way that organization might work. And they picked on, for selected Extinction Rebellion, a uh, quote for their decentralized way of organizing. And um, maybe there's some themes there that you've, you've spotted in your, from your own uh, definitions. Now, when, any, when, en, when anyone comes up with a, an idea of what is good leadership or who is a good leader, I think it's helpful to look at um, what we're focusing on. And uh, you can look at, are we focusing on the input, shall we say, the leader, the process of leading, or the outcome, leadership? So if we, so, uh, if we go back there, um, with Christiana Figueres, the, it's, fairly much, it's, it's focused on her as, as a person, the leader, so the input. Um, there's something there about a behavior in terms of um, of being direct about truth in, in, in that definition. And here we, if we look at Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, you see that, um, again, it's, it's a lot to do, with, to do with her. But then there is a behavior there, which is to fit the courage of, of, of challenge, challenging power. Um, and if you look at Extinction Rebellion, uh, that's where the, the decentralized way of organizing, that's more relevant to the, um, the process. Uh, none of the uh, definitions there that I've shared really focused on on the achievement or outcomes. So the different approaches to, to leadership um, that are out there can focus on the leader, for example, their trait, style, experience, power, and there are whole books written on that. Uh, but there's also a, a, some people focus more on the process, you know, supporting, communicating, directing, influencing, uh, helping make sense. Uh, and lots of books on, on uh, tips on that. And then some people focus on more on um, assessing leadership in terms of what's the, been the impact on a team or organization or movement. So are they confident, sharing a vision, having direction and purpose and so on, so on. Now, I've done that. I've unpacked that in a way, in that way, because um, there's a lot we can learn about leading leaders and leadership um, by being better at uh, learning through everyday life, through watching uh, behaviors and watching our own behaviors and thoughts and, and, and trying new things. So learning by watching and doing and becoming better at considering what is it we admire and what is it am I. Uh, can it help us uh, learn better in that way? So I typically ask students to look for shared themes of what they consider constitutes good leadership. And that kind of work that I ask the students to do um, kind of reflects what's often done by a lot of leadership scholars when they, they just try and find out what, uh, what is good leadership uh, by going into large organizations and doing studies and uh, trying to find out what people think uh, either about themselves as good leaders, which is um, possibly a bit ridiculous, um, but also sometimes studying uh, people in organizations and what they appreciate about someone who's, uh, uh, who's considered to be leading. And one of the books on this, uh, which um, drew upon masses of data of that kind of analysis, is The Leadership Ca Challenge by Kuzas and Posner. And they identified five behaviors, sort of emergent themes, that were leaders who were admired by colleagues. And they said they modeled the way 
they inspire a shared vision, they challenge the process, they enable others to act, and they encourage the heart. So these are nice little memorable phrases for different things. But um, that all sounds very interesting. And one can get some sense of confidence for thinking, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense to me and now I know what good leading looks like and what good leaders are about. But I wonder, is it really that useful? Um, and how, how, how is this reflection and, al and analysis on what we admire going, going to help us? One way it might be useful is so we become better at identifying um, what we admire uh, and, and being clear about what we're therefore going to aspire to do in our own lives. And having that model of leadership from the leadership challenge can be a useful sort of mirror and we can look at ourselves. Uh, and so long as it's not imposing a sort of a correct outlook, it, those sorts of models can, can help. But, um, but yeah, the, the problems with this, I would say the first issue is that people aren't consistent over time. However strongly we feel we know a character, people make choices. They're not constrained by a character trait. Uh, kind people do unkind things. Our confirmation bias leads us to see continuity of character, even when um, it might be directly contradicted by evidence of behavior. So if you thought someone's a mean bastard, then when he does something nice for an elderly woman, uh, what might you think? Perhaps it's because he feels guilty or he wants to make a good impression and confuse us because he's devious. In other words, all generalizations are likely to break down, whether about traits or behaviors. Um, so analysis of traits uh, is really based on this fundamental flaw of thinking that people have characteristics that are stable somehow. It's also quite arbitrary what opinions, ascribed qualities or behaviours are going to be lumped together or split apart into different traits by a particular analyst or author of a leadership book. The second issue is that even if there are consistent and coherent meaningful traits or behaviours from someone, um, there's something quite different about expressing those naturally uh, than learning that you should be exhibiting them in order to become a good leader. There's a massive difference uh, in that. But perhaps there's, well, I think there's a deeper problem with this whole approach to looking at leaders and leadership uh, with the aspiration to promote better leadership. And that is something to do with the focus. And I mentioned it at the start. So in the example that you, or the, the examples that you identified earlier, how important was the individual's leadership to the outcome compared to other factors? Um, and in nearly all cases, uh, people don't think about that. They think about uh, that person um, is really a great leader for some reason, and they may have included uh, the impact of the perceived impact of the person or that person's participation in massive social change or organizational success. Uh, but by looking at that individual in that context, what one can do is uh, prioritize and over prioritize that person and therefore the role of a special individual or someone who's seen as special in producing that change. And this is the great man view of history, which is kind of t typified perhaps quite well by, um, this is Napoleon writing to his brother in 1808, men are nothing, the man is everything, the general is the head to the whole of the army. And uh, yeah, and that painting, wow, he uh, he's um, trying to show a lot of, uh, a lot of that exceptional exceptionalness in uh, how he's riding the horse there. Now this isn't a um, unusual thing I discovered when I picked up a copy of China Daily a, a few years ago. There's still the same notion of the extremely great special 
leader, um, the modern CEO, uh, grappling a rapidly shifting business world. So this, um, these old ideas, these old stories of the exceptional individual being incredibly important to everything um, is quite pervasive and is, is promoted today, even in this sort of amusing uh, cover of China Daily. So what I want to do now is actually um, tell you about one study that helps us reflect on some biases when we're reflecting on leadership. Now, psychologists in the 1980s conducted studies where volunteers were shown statements about a situation in a company when a new manager or leader joined a team. Now, these were fictitious studies, but the volunteers did not know that. Uh, the studies described the new manager and then the performance of the team as a percentage of increase in sales. In some cases, the volunteers read that sales went up 2%, 10%, or 25%. The participants were asked to attribute significance of outcome to the leader versus other factors. So the significance to if the sales went up 2%, 10%, or 25%. So, you know, below average, average, above average, to, to, to attribute significance to, to, to the leader versus other factors like market conditions, suppliers, all sorts of technologies, for example. So um, here's, a, uh, here's uh, an example of what was given. John Smith, the director of sales from a major northeastern appliance firm. John assumed this position five years ago following his attainment of an MBA degree Prior to this MBA, John had completed a bachelor's degree in marketing. In this position, he has gained the respect of both his subordinates and superiors. On his last evaluation, John was rated as a capable worker and his subordinates have indicated that they enjoy working for him. John currently is in charge of five subordinates. All the subordinates working in John's department have a good working knowledge of marketing principles as demonstrated by their prior and current work experience. At the end of the fourth quarter, new customer accounts have shown a slight, moderate, large increase, 2%, 10%, 25%. So they would just change that for each volunteer during the year over the last year's performance. So you've got to note, therefore, that the participants would have read simply 2%, 10 or 25% and not known that other participants may have seen different percentage increase figures. They then rated the significance of John Smith to that outcome, 2%, 10 or 25%, so slight, moderate or large increase in sales. They then rated the significance of John Smith to the outcome and in contrast to other factors such as the market environment. It should be noted that the information in that example provides nothing with which you could assess whether John Smith in particular mattered to that outcome rather than other factors like the economy, technology or the competition or his five subordinates which you have been told did know their job. So. Volunteers off the street, given fictitious information, uh, the only thing that was different was 2, 10 or 25%, uh, and people had to rate whether, how significant the um, manager, the leader, was. So the tests were, this is, a, this is an old study, and I'm sharing it with you because it's a powerful one, and the data has been repeated again and again and again to find the same results. So the tests were conducted sufficient times to be statistically significant. And they also used other cases with other information about other bosses, which were purposely chosen to give the participant no meaningful information upon which to attribute the sales outcome to the boss rather than to other factors. So you should, uh, let's consider now what the results might be expected to be. We can plot performance of the X organizational unit on the x-axis along the bottom with 2% sales increase on the left and 25% uh, sales increase on, on, on the right, so high. Um, on the vertical y-axis, we could plot the views of the participants about the significance of the boss to these results. Now, for a moment, think about what the results should look like, given that the information was completely random. Some of you might consider that the results would be all over the place, and so there would be no correlation. Um, and if we wanted to draw a line through the results like that, it would have to be a horizontal line somewhere between these random results. Some of us might consider that if the results are really good at 
then we might accidentally consider that to be the result of the new boss rather than all other factors and thus drawing a line through the results might lead to one sloping upwards towards the right. But what do you think the real results are from hundreds of studies? Um, make a guess before uh, we go on. Have you guessed? Okay, so here are the results. The yellow line shows that participants thought the leader was more significant if the re results were poor or the results were good. They thought the leader was less significant if the results were ordinarily okay, moderate. The blue line here um, shows the strength uh, of attribution to other factors. So they thought other factors were less important than the leader if the results were either good or bad. Um, so note again that the data was intentionally designed to give no indication of the leader being particularly good or bad. This test was replicated around uh, the country and then around the world. Um, so think for a moment, what does this tell us about what people think about leaders or people with authority or about leadership? What does it mean that respondents rated leadership higher than other factors, even when they had little or no evidence upon which to base their judgment. James Mindel and his colleagues concluded that this was evidence that our, sen uh, our sense that leadership is salient um, to situations, processes, is our susceptibility. Uh, indeed, it can be questioned whether leadership is anything singular, singular and concrete at all, rather than just a label we throw around to tell, tell stories of cause, effect, praise and guilt, whatever the evidence we have. Mindel and his colleagues said that leadership is a collectively constructed romantic discourse. We are romanced by the idea that special individuals in power matter more than other factors. These findings from back in the 1980s show that we're all susceptible to thinking leadership matters the most in any situation. So let us unpack this idea a bit. By leadership, we could be implying good analytical capabilities, good communication skills, ethical credibility, ability to empathize, understanding of group processes, or understanding of how to manage people in difficult situations, and much more. There are lots of things we might be lumping together in this notion of leadership. Those things we vaguely and differently assume to be involved in leadership when we hear or use the word might actually be really important in certain situations. Yet this study suggests we need to be more questioning. And why is that? Can you think of the drawbacks of our collective susceptibility to focus on the leader as the most salient factor in organisational change or social change? You can pause the video. So you can um, see if you can think of at least a couple of, of drawbacks before we move on. So the, uh, the drawbacks of that romance, romantic view of the leadership um, that have been identified in research um, focus on how, or, or tell us about how a focus on the importance of senior role holders or managers prevents deeper analysis on how change does or doesn't happen. Um, it reduces the sense of agency and responsibility of those who don't have seniority. It generates a very high risk point of failure in a project or movement and it can encourage narcissism within senior role holders. Some scholars in this field have looked at how the myth of the all-important leader has been promoted by established institutions of various forms and has a suppressant effect on democratic participation. Writing in a top academic journal on human resources, Gemmell and Oakley said, I quote, Leadership is a myth that functions to reinforce existing social beliefs and structures about the necessity of hierarchy and leaders in organisations. A serious sign of social pathology, a special case of a myth that induces massive learned helplessness amongst members of a social system. Ouch. 
Now, this critique of leadership uh, is not at all a new idea. It's not unknown to management studies, policy studies, and other fields of scholarship and education. This quote here on this slide is from 30 years ago from a mainstream management publisher uh, explaining why the dominant concepts of leadership in 1990, or just before then, um, have been really unhelpful for corporations. They say at the centre of this evolving drama is the critical need for organisations to adapt con to continually fluctuating environments. This change renders large centralised hierarchies obsolete and selects for systems in which leadership resides in the outer boundaries as well as in the centre. Um, so yeah, this, this has been around for a while. Um, and a lot of work that critiques the mainstream views of leadership um, and it's something that I've taught, researched, advised, and published on for some years now. Uh, the field is, has a name. It's called Critical Leadership Studies. And within it, we look at how the concept of leadership is socially constructed, how it's, uh, how it's sort of built by us people talking about it. Um, and then we look at how certain social constructions of leadership uh, have certain effects, sort of privilege certain views and people and not others. Um, so that's uh, the field that I want, that I draw upon in, in, in this course. The critical leadership uh, approach asks questions such as, does leadership require leaders? Is leadership a good thing? Does leadership matter more than followership? Does leadership matter more than other factors? Does leadership exist? beyond the word for it, really. Um, and not really is the answer to these questions, with various theoretical, philosophical, and empirical bases for that answer. And yet we still work on it. We still teach about it. And that's because uh, the, people who are, the people who are interested in leadership are typically interested in very important questions about purpose, meaning, um, uh, effectiveness, uh, change, um, how to get things done, and so forth. And they're interested in questions of legitimacy as well. So it's a very important space to, to be in, uh, but be in in a way which doesn't just assume uh, leadership uh, in the way it is in mainstream society. So Critical leadership as a field is one where we're seeking to shift thinking about leadership, to emphasise leadership acts that are enabling, distributed and emergent. This new approach to leadership is, well, is not so new, but is certainly gaining ground and influencing the design of training at the top of large organisations worldwide, as well as in civil society and in social movements. It's useful for people to experience processes where they can see themselves um, uh, they can see themselves as, as like, ah, I see how I was assuming certain concepts and how that was influencing my behavior. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that can be done in class. Some, some processes, experiential learning around that can be done in class. But there are also powerful ones, more fun, that can be done outside. For instance, the local leadership development consultants uh, in Cumbria, in the Lake District in the UK, uh, called Impact International. Um, they take groups out onto the fells and uh, they tell them that they have to make their own, their own way back to the hotel, either by a long route, um, all on paths, or a shorter route, which then means that they have to cross a lake, uh, or even shorter route um, with some abseiling involved. And they have to discuss and negotiate amongst themselves what to do. And one of the people in the group might know some orienteering or they may know some abseiling or how to captain a boat. Um, and one person might know how to facilitate meetings. And some members of the group can experience the processes where someone decides to volunteer to lead in a particular moment, perhaps because they know how to abseil. Um, and then how some people in the group then look to that person as the leader suddenly for the rest of the time or how the person who was helpful in that one instance because of a particular skill set then assumes that they are a leader for that group. And that move from a leadership act to a leadership position 
uh, whether ascribed or assumed, that occurs subtly uh, and is important to identify so groups can become more fluid about who steps up and who steps back at different moments depending on different contexts. So that's the kind of fun you can get up uh, in the Lake District, um, but um, uh, hopefully it can also be useful to, to work together online. I think all these things can complement each other. The next question, of course, is how do you promote it? Um, if you buy into this version of leadership, um, what are the challenges and opportunities to shift perspectives on leadership in this way? And so I think uh, now would be a good time if you took a break and had a think about the challenges and opportunities to promote a shift in perspective on leadership in your workplace or community. And then after you've done that and made some notes, if you're a participant in one of my courses, please post those thoughts on the discussion board of the course website. And uh, if you're not, but if you're a member of the Deep Adaptation Forum's business and finance group um, in the professions network, then also there'll be a thread where I would very much welcome you sharing your thoughts on how the challenges and opportunities to shift perspectives about leadership from this perspective that I've just covered. So yeah, press pause before, um, before continuing, please. So, um, welcome back. For the rest of this lecture, I'm going to give you an example of how this critical approach to leadership was used in a high stakes situation, or at least it seemed to me at the time. It came about because at the end of 2016, I was uh, giving some voluntary input to the leadership office of the Labour Party about their communications. I've become convinced that due to how bad our situation is with climate change, that we needed uh, radical action by governments, a kind of emergency socialism to both cut carbon and adapt to the impacts of climate disruption. Now, by early 2017, with my colleague at the time, Mark Lepatin, I was hired to advise the leader of the Labour Party on a new communication strategy and it gave me the opportunity to put some of these ideas on critical leadership into practice. Now, the UK general election of 2017 encouraged a whole nation to discuss leadership. The election strategists of the incumbent Conservative government decided that the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, was the weak point of the Labour Party. When the unplanned snap election was called in March 2017, Corbyn's popularity was at an all-time low, according to the polls the you know, low 20s. Um, in terms of grassroots membership, the Labour Party had been re-energised by his explicitly left-wing agenda, with remarkable numbers of people signing up, making the party the largest in Western Europe at the time. But in Parliament, the majority of his elected MPs were sceptical of his ability to lead the party or the country, uh, and many, many had not been shy in telling the media about that. Um, and many people also in the party apparatus behind the scenes were uh, against him and uh, the, the team around him. So they were believing that it was only a matter of time before he was replaced and the party would become more centrist, or at least more focused on winning support from swing voters. So these divisions meant that there was a constant flow of negative media about Jeremy Corbyn and the party at the time um, when I started working for them in uh, in early February 2017. The decision of the highly paid consultants to the Conservative Party, headed by Linton Crosby, uh, their decision to focus on the leadership of Theresa May and contrast it with that of Jeremy Corbyn did have a rationale. After years of austerity, falling living standards and no sign of economic recovery having created decent careers for British citizens, there wasn't much success to point to as a party of government given the uncertainties, divisions and difficulties in navigating Britain's exit from the European Union, it would be a challenge for the government to develop and champion a vision to the electorate. Therefore, they based their campaign on the idea that the election was a choice between Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May as leader. They decided to describe May's qualities in a way that could reveal the weaknesses they perceived in Corbyn. Their phrase for the election, strong and stable leadership in the national interest, was chosen because it could be supported even if you did not think things were going well for the country under the current government. 
although during the campaign the slogan and the ideas it conveyed were broadened to describe the Conservative Party as a whole, the first month of campaigning was very clearly focused on conveying a description of the Prime Minister herself. So that was the majority of the campaign that was focused in that way, because the campaign is only six weeks long. The fact that a top political communications agency chose, chose this framing of the election about leadership highlights a couple of things. First, it shows how the idea that individual senior role holders are the most important factor in governance was assumed to be widespread in Britain. Second, it assumed that strength and stability would be seen as the best attributes of leadership today. The alternative is that the communications consultants were not even conscious of their assumptions in that choice of framing. So how was strong being defined or implied by the Conservative Party communications at the time? Strong in consultation? Strong in responsiveness? Strong in openness? No, not at all. It wasn't defined. But the way the idea was invoked and the tone of voice often used was that strength meant resisting others with different views. But what did that suggest about leadership? That it involves not responding to outside pressures or alternative ideas? Looking back at the 2017 election campaign, it's amazing how little debate about what leadership is actually occurred during those weeks. That lack of debate suggested many journalists may have imbibed certain views about what leadership means, and they wouldn't be untypical in that, as I've described from earlier research. When answering questions, things got a bit farcical at times, as this quote I'm showing you here from Theresa May illustrates. We will show leadership because that is what leaders do. Notice the word show. It means leadership is somehow performative. That is revealed if we used a different word to describe some of the things we might mean by leadership. For instance, good management or good decision making. Would we show good management? Would we show good decision making? If we talk like that, we would sound either insincere or maybe insecure. That it could be said about leadership indicates how the word is no longer a description of phenomena, but a statement of belief in a worldview. As such, it was a concept that's ripe for, that was ripe for reframing. Now you might imagine that people with a background in critical leadership, like me, were thinking um, what we were thinking as the Conservative Party and the journalists were constantly bashing Jeremy Corbyn as not being a leader and suggesting Theresa May was a leader. Faced with a strong and stable leadership focus from the Conservatives, the accusation Corbyn was not a leader, the lack of questioning of what leadership meant, the centrality of it in many discussions about which party to vote for, and the socially disabling orthodoxy of, on leadership. What should one do? The dilemma take on the clothes of leadership as falsely assumed by many people, or seek to challenge that. Of course, I don't mean the clothes literally. We might conform on style, but it would be not authentic to conform to false or disabling orthodoxies about leadership itself. The chosen response was to tackle the issue head on, to try to reframe leadership and reframe Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and to reframe Theresa May's leadership. And to do this in a way that was in line with Jeremy's long-held views on politics and on social change. Now, Jeremy Corbyn had always said politics is not a personality contest. But psychologists have shown if you don't give people a backstory or something to help them guess one for you, then they're going to assume one or take other people's ideas about who you are why you do what you do. So one either consciously frames and narrates one's own life, intention and situation, or you have it done for you. There is no frame or narrative-free mode of existence in any form of public life. He had resisted for a while, but Jeremy now had to address his leadership as it was being made a central issue of the 2017 general election campaign. So, um, I worked with him and his team um, on what would become the first speech where he actually talked about himself. Now, he strongly believed leadership should be about service and recognizing everyone has a contribution to make. So our aim was to develop this idea so he could give a clearer explanation of that philosophy of leadership, uh, why he believes that and why it is an approach that was really needed at that time. It was also a chance to try and put some of the previous 
acrimony behind the party. I'm going to highlight a few quotes from the speech uh, that show a reframed version of leadership uh, in practice, in terms of at least in terms of how it's described by a politician to an audience during a general election campaign. So here's some quotes um, from his speech, Stuffing Up for Britain, April 29th, uh, 2017. Whereas insecure leaders want to feel stronger by asking you to give them more power, I recognize strong leadership as equipping you with more power. This defines leadership as acts that enable others. It also reframes the snap general election as not something indicating the strength of a leader. Rather, it suggests that to ask for more power is the opposite of leadership strength. Some might recall that when announcing the election, Theresa May asked for the nation to give her more power in her Brexit negotiations. But that was pure speculation or a fabrication that EU negotiators would really care how many votes the Conservative government had in the UK. In reflecting on what he had learned over his political career, Jeremy Corbyn said that, I quote, political leaders can, if they want to, create and preserve the space for others to organise and transform countries. Now that's describing leadership as providing opportunities for others to engage. It reflected a distributed and collective approach to leading change. We also wanted to reframe the previous years of discord within the Labour Party after he'd been elected leader. That was key because some people were saying he couldn't even lead a united party, let alone a country. So he said, I respect my critics when they make a reasoned case. They're doing what I've often tried to do, and that is to challenge leadership. If leaders go unchallenged, they can make some of the most damaging mistakes. It's the job of leadership to hold open the space for dissent, new thinking and fit for purpose policy. I've always believed in standing firm and empowering others to make up their minds and come on board when they're ready. Now, this is the view of leadership. This is the, the view that leadership is improved by reasoned dissent, and therefore strength is about creating spaces for vibrant discussion and new ideas from, to emerge. And he went on to describe how shutting down dissent is a dangerous approach to take uh, and how it had backfired uh, in British history in the past. Now, the research on leadership that I've read has shown that senior role holders can help their groups, or organizations or countries um, in one key way, anxiety management. It appears that if people believe that the top person is predictable, if not supremely capable, but predictable, then they're less anxious about their context and can plan and act. It was somewhat smart, therefore, for the Conservative Party strategists back in 2017 to speak of stable leadership. But there are other situations where predictability and sta stability do not help reduce anxiety. Those are times when a group or organisation or community or a nation needs a major change in direction. So we wanted to really talk about, about that. What is a reassuring form of leadership when a time when you need massive change? We could seek a fragile calm and hope someone in power knows what they're doing and will guide us through. That means looking to whoever's in charge and welcoming their reassurance. We don't look further, we don't ask questions. I'm in this job because I believe there's a better way to respond. It's about rejecting fake reassurances or simple slogans from government. It's about sharing ideas and deciding upon real and lasting answers. Each of us has a contribution to make. If you agree, our times demand a, a response from all parts of society in all corners of our country, then I'm proud to be your leader. And if you want someone to hold that space open for you to help change the direction of your life and our country, then I'm proud to be your leader. Therefore, he was saying that the function of leadership in reducing anxiety should arise from faith in the collective and not in an imaginary superhero. There are other things about leadership in the speech uh, which you can access by the link in the video lecture notes below. Now, of course, it's difficult to know whether a speech is a good one or not, or helps in the broader effort of reframing a debate. Um, uh, but we saw some initial evidence of its reception. The author of the, uh, the book about Jeremy's rise to the leadership of the Labour Party uh, tweeted his approval immediately. And uh, the newspapers uh, noted it because it was the first time Jeremy Corbyn was really talking about um, why he was why he was leading and why he was right for that moment. Um, 
Now, of course, one speech doesn't have that much effect on a campaign, and Jeremy Corbyn didn't want to say much more about his own life or approach to leadership after that, because he believed what's more important is the platform and policies, the philosophy they represent and the social movement of people that support them. In the six weeks of the campaign, the party increased its vote share by almost double what some of the opinion polls were indicating at the start, winning the biggest vote share since World War II. At the time, in the summer of 2017, just after the election, Jeremy Corbyn's approach and message was appealing to many, particularly the young. He even became the biggest attraction at the Glastonbury Music Festival, and he became famous around the world. Friends in Africa and Asia were saying congratulations to him, not realising he'd not actually won the election, and also saying congratulations to me and others, even though um, he hadn't won. But suddenly, becoming an icon of a revived and hopeful left um, would pose interesting challenges um, if you're having a post-heroic view of leadership. So how can you, uh, how can a senior role holder and their colleagues manage a paradox where a leader's popularity might reduce people's search for their own agency and building up their own agency? Or where the power of a movement becomes dependent on the reputation of the guy at the top? Or when your opponents regroup to chisel away at the image of your leader as the best way of undermining your movement? Any perceived dependence creates a huge vulnerability in any movement. I stopped working for the leader's office on election day in June 2017, so was not around to see how they were managing those challenges. So now, 2020, April, a few years later, the situation we face with the pandemic and its aftermath, with climate chaos spreading, it invites us to learn and to practice leadership beyond the unsustainable concepts and habits that has brought us to this disastrous moment. And that's why, uh, despite having gone very much full time on deep adaptation to climate change, I still believe that uh, working in leadership and leadership development and leadership advisory um, is important. Uh, is very important in order to help people escape old narratives which are quite restricting um, in order to better engage each other to understand how we might reduce harm uh, in, in the years ahead. I do recommend that if you have time, and I'll put a link to it in, this, uh, in, the, in the slide notes, in the um, video notes, I recommend you read Beyond Unsustainable Leadership, where, with Richard Little and Neil Sutherland, I'm bringing a critical leadership for scholarship perspective to bear on our environmental predicament. Uh, and it's, it, it's also where we go much more into the, um, the sociological background for some of the things that I've been talking about. The main issue, of course, is, is not that leadership is a concept that, that's badly un understood and, and deployed. Rather, it, I've given you an example of it because you know, any concept is socially constructed and exerts power on us and society. Although we might think we are an independent thinker, we risk being neither fully free nor fully engaged in community um, if, we don't, if we don't understand the power of, of socially constructed uh, concepts and discourse. To counter that, we can grow our ability to notice the framings and narratives we are told and we use ourselves, and who is, uh, and who or what they're serving or influencing. And that approach can be used when looking at medicine or governance or economics or climate or sustainability. Now, when talking about this topic, sociologists often use the term discourse. I think I probably used it once or twice in this lecture. So it refers to the institutionalized patterns of thought expressed through language, symbol and behavior, which both embody and reproduce power in society. Critical social theorists look at discourse and power with a desire to free themselves and others from unconscious patterns of thinking which might privilege the few. So that's me. I'm one of them. That's what I do when I look at discourse and look at power. I'm interested in people freeing themselves and others from unconscious patterns of thinking which don't help them. Cognitive linguists have broken down that big picture discourse into smaller nuggets with the idea of frames, which are sets of interlocking ideas which are ingrained in our minds. Frames associate words together to encourage us to look at phenomena in one way and not another. 
For instance, it's typical to say that jobs are created and lost. It sounds normal to say that, but it's actually quite arbitrary because the opposite of created uh, is destroyed. Yet the media report on jobs created and lost, not jobs created and jobs destroyed. The choice of words is a choice of framing a situation. Because if you say a job is created as a suggestion of agency, someone had to create it. So there's someone to thank for it. But the opposite, jobs destruction, no, that's, that's not used and thus people don't ask who to blame. If you're losing a job or losing something can mean to accidentally misplace it, like your keys, or to have an, an accident, like losing a, a leg. Neither make sense if you think about it, for losing one's job. So when saying jobs and create, are created and lost, not created and destroyed, or not jobs found and lost, we're framing employment and economic situations in ways which allow praise when new jobs arise and remove responsibility or blame when jobs are cancelled. I give you that example. It's a very simple one, an everyday one, um, to show how um, it's important and in my courses, we explore the ideological work of some mainstream concepts and framings. In order to help you think more critically as you consider your own, um, your own future action, um, as someone leading or not. So we've come to the end of the lecture. I just want to say that if you are taking a leadership course with me in the next days, um, please make sure you do the pre-reading and the preparatory exercise before our live classes begin and either email it to me or my tutor. And information on that will be on the, the course website. Um, I just want to end with a quick summary of what we've covered and some of the key points that we're going to build on in the course. So leadership's a widely assumed and mythologized concept, and as such, that's not helpful. It means we don't think, and also it may mean that we assume things which are just really privileging some and disabling our own um, ability to inquire, to learn, and to affect change. Secondly, with processes of reflection, comparison, and discussion, we can develop our approaches to leadership. So it is useful still to look at models and reflect on them and to talk about what we consider to be good or bad practices in leadership. Um, third, our understanding of leadership can evolve so we look at a range of competencies and attributes for contributing to groups achieving significant outcomes. And this is it, you see. Once you, once you uh, unpack uh, the mainstream notion of leadership, see it as unhelpful, you start to think, well, actually, how do groups function well? How can they change? How can they achieve significant things? And so you start to look at, well, how do you have a leaderful group? And that's where we get to with, 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 with this lecture now. This is, I think, where we've got to. It's that, that we need, therefore, leadership is good. Leadership is a distributed act. And um, it's emergent, it's episodic, and anyone in a group can lead in a moment and so it's how do you cultivate that in a group and that's what we're going to be looking at quite a bit in the course fourth if learning leadership for sustainability adaptation or emergency or disaster recovery is to be useful then i think it really needs insights from critical leadership studies the kind of insights that i've shared with you in this lecture and then with that context we can really then dive into what might be called leadership for sustainability or leadership for deep adaptation, which is what we'll be doing. So uh, thank you uh, for paying attention, following this. Um, hopefully it's given you some sense of the, some of the philosophy behind the course, at least in terms of the concept of leadership. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you um, online and in some cases in person uh, to take this stuff a lot, lot further, um, both in terms of uh, reading, philosophy, experiential exercises and talking practical implications and efforts at really trying to put these ideas into practice in your own life and work and being supported in learning as you do that. Thank you.